Hello and welcome to another episode of Leaders of Transformation. You know, as we finish out this year, 2019, and go into 2020, a whole new decade, there's a lot of excitement about this new decade and anticipation about uh, dreams fulfilled, you know, all that awesome stuff that happens at the new year. And I was thinking about what topics would be really good to bring to you uh, that would serve you in this in this particular season. So. Uh, I was actually talking with Luke Dupron, who told me he had an amazing guest on his show, which is a great podcast called Live Great Lifestyle. Luke is uh, into health and he is helping men to level up. And so um, it's a great podcast. Highly recommend you check it out. But he mentioned a guest that was on his show, Near Al, and, uh, and he told me about his book that he just wrote, Indistractable, and I thought, Perfect. That is how we're going to end the, end the year. Mm -hmm. So near, I brought him here to the Leaders of Transformation so he can talk to you about his book. He actually wrote his first book was Hooked, How to Create Habit-Forming Products. And it was a Wall Street best, uh, Journal bestseller. And his recent book, Indistractable, How to Control Your Attention and Choose Your Life, has been uh, already very successful. It just came out in September. And so we're just really excited to have him here. Nir, welcome to Laser Transformation. Thank you so much. Great to be here. It is a pleasure. And I went through your book and was it's just it's it's rich of it's got hacks in there, life hacks, habit hacks, and there's so much more than just what we think about in terms of distractions. And I know that when we were talking previous, you're like, let's use you as an example. <laughs> so this will be fun and we'll see how this, <laughs> this goes. We get it. I'll be fully exposed in my distractions. Those are the best is, interviews. It, absolutely. So it's going to be a lot of fun. I also want to thank our listeners for being here because you're the reason why we do this podcast. And afterwards, I would encourage you to go on leadersoftransformation.com. Of course, all the show notes are going to be there so that you can connect with Nir. Um, but also because we'd love to hear your stories. We'd love to hear what you're doing, uh, how this is impacting you, and also how we can support you along your journey as in becoming a leader of transformation. So we encourage you that. Also follow us on social media. And uh, we love sharing stories of people that are making a great impact in the world and also companies that are doing good. And so you can follow us and learn about that. And uh, if you like this episode, which I suspect you will, I really do believe there's going to be some powerful information shared here, please go on Apple Podcasts and leave us a rating review. It does help us to get a greater reach. We're in 130 countries, and we just want to continue to extend that reach out. So with that, Nir, let's talk about um, you. I mean, I can brag on you. You are a very successful author. You founded two tech companies and you've taught at Stanford, the Graduate School of Business and so forth. So that's kind of the quick overview, but there, you're so much more than that. I know you're also an, an active investor in habit forming, forming companies. So this area of habit forming mm -hmm. technology is obviously a passion. So where did that start for you? Yeah, so it's really about, you know, my first book, Hooked, was all about how do we use the secrets behind why products like Facebook and Twitter and Instagram and WhatsApp and Slack, what makes these products so sticky? And uh, I taught a course at Stanford for many years about this topic, and I decided to share my research with the world so that any company out there, any leader building a product can build the kind of product that people use because they want to, not because they feel like they have to. I mean, imagine how much money you could save in advertising if people used your product habitually, if they came back to your product or service out of habit. And so you know, the, the, the idea here was we, that we can really change people's lives for the better, uh, stealing some of these secrets. You know, why is it only the social media companies and the gaming companies that can build such engaging products and services? Anyone can do it if they know the deeper psychology behind how habit-forming technologies are built. And so we've seen companies like Fitbod gets people hooked to exercising in the gym using my hook model. Uh, Kahoot, the world's largest educational software, uses my hook model to get kids hooked onto in-classroom learning. I've worked with publications like the New York Times to teach them how to get people hooked onto reading the news every day. So we can use these same tactics for good to help people live better lives. And because of my extensive research into this area of how habits are built, I also know the Achilles heel 
of these technologies. And I can help people learn ways to fight distraction because what we see here is that, you know, today distraction is, is really a plague. We, we all basically know what to do, right? Who can honestly say that we don't know how to live more healthfully, how to lose weight, how to connect with our family, how to do better at our job? We all have Google. We can search for the answers. We all basically know the common sense rules for how to do this stuff. So the question is not, you know, we don't know, have the excuse anymore to say, well, I just didn't know how. Of course you know how. Everybody knows the basics of this stuff. The question is, why don't we do what we say we're going to do in all aspects of our life? right? We, we say we're going to exercise, but we don't. We say we're going to eat healthfully, but we don't. We say we're going to uh, be fully present with our kids, with our, with our significant others, with our friends, but we're distracted. We say we're going to work on that big project, and yet we procrastinate. Why don't we do what we say we're going to do? And imagine what would happen in your life if you did what you said you would do, if you lived with personal integrity. Now, I can talk about this today because I've spent the past five years researching and writing this book, but let me tell you, I was patient zero. I needed this more than anyone else in the world, and so that's why I wrote this book because I read every book on the topic to try and answer my question, and they all gave me this really simplistic answer of, well, just get rid of the technology. It's the technology that's causing the distraction. And so I tried that. I got rid of my cell phone and I got a flip phone instead of a, an iPhone. I got a flip phone back from the 1980s and I, I, or 1990s and I, I bought myself a word processor uh, with no internet connection so I could finally do the writing and you know, do it without focus. And it didn't work. I kept getting distracted. I would say, oh, you know, my, my desk needs to be cleaned up or the trash should be taken out or let me just do a bit more research in one of these books. And I kept getting distracted because without getting to the root cause of why we get distracted, we will always find something to distract ourselves. Distraction is not a new problem. Plato talked about it 2,500 years before the iPhone. <laughs> so these technologies did not create distraction. It's been with us for a very, very long time. And so the idea here is how can we start to understand distraction so that we can get a grip on it in order to live the kind of lives we really want to live and to be the kind of leaders that we know we can be. Well, you just covered off a whole bunch of those distractions that I have. So we'll mm -hmm. get into that later, but part of the know, club. I'm I'm yes. with you. <laughs> well, and I think that I think we all get it. Even as focused as we might be, there's always going to be those distractions. And I know you talk about internal triggers, external triggers, right. there's distractions, you know, whether it's my cat climbing all over me in the middle of a podcast. <laughs> That's an interview. external trigger, yeah. That's an external trigger. <laughs> And uncontrollable. An external tigger. Is that, is that, there funny? you go. That's terrible. That's, that's no, that's good. not good. <laughs> and, you know, and so there, so talk about, talk about those triggers. And I, I yeah. mean, nowadays, yes, like these distractions have been around for years, but it's so much more emphasized now mm -hmm. because yeah. of what we've got going on. Yeah. So let, let's start with what do I mean by distraction? Let's go ahead and define what this is. And the best way to understand distraction is to understand what distraction is not. The opposite of distraction is not focus. The opposite of distraction is traction. In fact, both words, traction and distraction, come from the same Latin root, trahare, which means to pull. And they, uh, they both end in the same six letters, A-C-T-I-O-N, that spells action. So traction is any action that pulls you towards what you want to do. The opposite of traction is distraction, anything that pulls you away from what you plan to do. So this is important for two reasons. Number one, anything can be a distraction. How many times have we sat at our desks and we said, okay, now I'm going to work on that big project. Now I'm going to do that thing I plan to do. Here I go. I'm going to stop procrastinating. I'm going to get to work, but let me check email first right? Let me scroll that Slack channel. Let me just do that one quick thing that feels worky. It feels work-related, but really it's a distraction because it's taking us off course from what we plan to do. And I argue that that type of distraction is actually much more pernicious than, you know, scrolling Facebook or, or, or playing a video game. Because at least, you know, if you're playing a video game at your desk at work, it's pretty clear you're slacking off. But I would argue that checking email when you really want to work on that big project is just as pernicious because distraction has tricked you into prioritizing the urgent at the expense of the important. Yeah. And so and that's entrepreneurs and entrepreneurs, oh, yeah. just on that point, how many times have we heard entrepreneurs say, I mean, I'm a business coach. And so I hear it a lot. I am so busy. I am busy, mm -hmm. busy, 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 but busy doing what? 
Right. And right. yeah, checking their email. How many hours a week do I work? Oh, I work all these long hours. Right. Running 100 yeah. miles an hour in the wrong direction is right. just as bad as, as not working at all. <laughs> right. Yeah. yeah so, exactly. so this is a really good point. So we have this dichotomy of traction and distraction. So, you know, point number one, anything can be a distraction. Point number two, anything can be traction. So as long as you plan for what it is you want to do with your time, then you, you, you do things according to your values and your schedule. There's nothing wrong with any of these activities. So there's nothing wrong with going on Facebook. There's nothing wrong with watching a YouTube video with whatever it is you want to do. What's, why is playing a video game somehow morally inferior to watching football on TV? There's no difference. As long as you do it on your schedule, you can do those things without guilt. The problem is that so many of us, we're so busy with this damn to-do list. We all keep these to-do lists. And I can tell you about why I hate to-do lists in just a minute. But we all keep these crazy to-do lists and we don't actually get to have any fun. Because even when we say, okay, I'm going to enjoy myself, I'm gonna play with my kids, I'm gonna watch a movie, I'm gonna enjoy myself, in the back of our heads is all this stuff we didn't get done every day. And so we reinforce this self-image day after day after day that I'm a loser, I still didn't do what I said I'm gonna do, I'm lying to myself day in and day out. And in fact, that decreases our sense of agency as opposed to when we become indistractable. When you say you're gonna do something and you actually do it, you are reinforcing a behavioral pattern that says to yourself, I am indistractable. I do what I say I'm going to do. And that is incredibly powerful. So we've got traction, we've got distraction. Now we have to ask ourselves, what prompts us to take these actions, right? We have two things that prompt us towards traction and distraction. We have what's called the external trigger. The external trigger are the pings, the dings, the rings, all of these things in our environment that can prompt us towards traction or distraction. That's what people tend to blame. And there's lots of ways that we can hack back those external triggers. But more so, what we really need to focus on is the root cause of distraction. The root cause of distraction is not the external trigger, but in fact, the internal trigger. That we know that most distraction does not start from outside of us, but starts from within. Most distraction starts from within. How? Turns out that the reason we tend to get distracted is because we are trying to escape an uncomfortable emotional state. That is the root cause of all distraction. If you can't sit at a business meeting for 15 minutes without checking email, I got news for you. It's not your email. If you can't have dinner with your family without this constant itch that you need to check or do something or turn on the TV in the background or something has to constantly be on to, dis to distract you, I'm telling you, it's not the device. It's, what going, it's what's going on inside of our heads, not, not what's in our devices. And why does this happen? Well, to answer this question, by the way, this is Plato's same question. Plato asked this question of why do we do things against our better interests? Well, we have to ask ourselves a deeper question of why do we do anything and everything? What's the seat of human motivation? And it turns out most people don't understand motivation. Most people think that motivation is about carrots and sticks, right? It's about the pursuit of pleasure and the avoidance of pain. That's not true. Turns out that neurologically speaking, it's pain all the way down. Everything we do, everything we do is about the desire to escape discomfort, even the pursuit of pleasurable responses, right? Wanting, craving, wanting, lusting, de desire, all of these things, you know, there's a reason we say love hurts. All of these feelings are psychologically destabilizing. Now we know this to be true uh, physiologically, if you go outside and it's cold outside, that's uncomfortable. That's, that that just doesn't feel good. So you put on a jacket. When you come back inside, now it's too hot, you take it off. If uh, you're hungry, you feel hunger pangs and your brain tells you go eat because that doesn't feel good. So you eat. And if you eat too much, now you're stuffed. Oh, that doesn't feel good. That's uncomfortable. So you stop eating. So that's physiological sensations that we seek to escape discomfort. That's called the homeostatic response. The same thing holds true for our psychological sensations. So when we're feeling lonely, check Facebook. When we're uncertain, Google. When we are bored, turn on the news, sports, stock prices, Pinterest, Reddit, all of these products and services cater to these uncomfortable sensations. So what this means, if all human behavior is prompted by a desire to escape discomfort, what that means is that time management is pain management. And this is incredibly important because I don't care what tips and tricks and life hacks you use, 
If you don't understand this fact that the reason you are not doing whatever it is you say you're going to do, and by the way, if you don't have this problem, this is the wrong podcast episode, right? If you're the kind of person who does what they say they're going to do every single day, good on you, keep doing whatever you're doing. But if you're anything like I was, and you would you lie to yourself just as I did. I lie to myself day after day. I say, okay, I'm definitely going to do those things on my to do list. I'm definitely going to work out. I'm definitely going to spend quality time with my kids. And yet, I would keep not doing those things. The root cause of the problem is our inability to deal with these uncomfortable emotional states in a healthier way that leads us towards traction rather than distraction. So that's the first step to becoming indistractable. Wow. Thank you for, for that. Because I think that, yeah, this whole pain and pleasure uh, idea, I mean, Tony Robbins has talked about it, you know, taught this, we're either seeking to avoid pain or to seek pleasure. And um, very, very insightful when you think of the fact that everything that we do is actually to avoid pain. And so when I look at some of the things that have, when I, when I get distracted, um, and what you said, it's like avoiding something. I think about uh, when I was having you share, when you were sharing there, is I'm thinking, okay, well, how do we, how do we identify it? And let's say, for example, in your book, you talk about with your, with your daughter, right? Mm -hmm. So you absolutely love your daughter and yet you were distracted in that. So right. it's not, it's not your daughter and it's not, I mean, you mentioned it's not your phone, but it's also right. not your daughter. And it's not that you don't want to be in that situation. Right. So right. where is the, yeah. what's the you're pain right. that you're trying to avoid? It wasn't her fault. Uh, it wasn't my phone's fault. It was that there was stuff going on in my life that I needed to deal with in a healthier manner. Uh, part of it was that I was, I had business stuff on my mind, that I was dealing with stress, uncertainty, anxiety, uh, you know, and, and frankly, at that moment, I'd been playing with my daughter for maybe a little too much time, <laughs> right? That, you know, a, a grown man can only take so much toddler time before I need a break, but I could have handled it in a much healthier way as opposed to taking out my cell phone and sending the message to my daughter that my phone is more important than she is. I could have handled that in a healthier way. One of the things we did is that now whenever we play, you know, we used to spend time together and say, okay, here I go. I'm going to spend quality time with my daughter. Yay. Aren't I a good dad? And then I would get incredibly bored. And, and I'll be honest with you. I was even ashamed that I was bored, but I was because we were doing stuff that wasn't interesting for too long. How many games of Uno can a grown man play? Right? So here's what we did. We, we started what we call a fun jar. So now every time we spend time together, and we do it in smaller increments. It's not the whole day anymore because, you know, I need a break too. Now when we spend an hour, an hour and a half together, we sat down and we wrote a hundred activities that we both enjoy. Not just what she enjoys, but what we both enjoy. We wrote them on slips of paper. We rolled them up. We put them in a little glass jar. I have it right behind me. And every time we have some time together, we take the fun jar out and we draw from that fun jar one activity, one thing for us to do together. And so now I don't have that boredom anymore because I'm doing something I actually enjoy with her, right? We, we shoot some hoops, we go to the park, we do something we both enjoy. And so that, that's part of this equation. That's about what, what I call reimagining the task. And I give all kinds of ways that we can see the task we're doing differently so it's not quite so taxing on us. That's one technique. There's actually three techniques to mastering these internal triggers. The first one is to reimagine the trigger, to respond differently. Whenever we feel this, uh, this, this internal trigger that we are trying to escape, how can we see it differently so that we can uh, utilize it to lead us towards traction rather than distraction? There's all kinds of techniques around that. And the final technique is about reimagining our temperament to see ourselves differently so that we don't use our identity or these false notions of our, of our, of our temperament or our disposition to lead us astray. You know, many of us carry around these self-limiting beliefs. I'm a morning person. I'm a Myers-Briggs thing of the role, or, or whatever. You know, I'm, I'm a this, I'm a that. And many times, you know, many, there are actually psychological traits that do tend to carry over. The, 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 we call them the big five, openness, conscientiousness, extroversion, uh, neuroticism. There are, are these, these traits that do carry over. But most of the labels that people carry around with them are not really based on much science. <laughs> and they're actually these self-limiting beliefs. So I talk about some of that and I debunk a lot of myths. For example, the myth of ego depletion. Ego depletion says that you run out of willpower. 
And we've all heard this in one form or another, that uh, if you, you, know, you get to the end of the day, this used to happen to me all the time. I would come home from work. I would say to myself, boy, I'm spent. I've got no more willpower left. Give me that pint of Ben and Jerry's and I'm going to sit on the couch and watch two hours of Netflix because I can't make any more decisions. I'm spent. I deserve it. Turns out that there was some research that showed that maybe willpower is a limited resource. And, and uh, we, we call this ego depletion, that willpower runs out like gas in a gas tank. Some, some psychologists thought, you know what, this is a little bit fishy. And what we do in the scientific community when a study sounds fishy, we replicate the study. We just run the study again. And it turns out that the psychologists could not replicate this study. The effects was not seen in further experiments. And so it turns out ego depletion doesn't really exist. Except, except in one group of people. One group of people really do run out of willpower like gas in a gas tank. And those people, this is the work of Carol Dweck at Stanford. You might have read her book, Mindset. Fantastic work that she does. She found that the only people who actually do exhibit ego depletion and run out of willpower are people who believe that willpower is a limited resource. Those were the people who exhibited this trait and only those people. And so this is so important for us to understand because we hear it today in the media all the time. Technology is hijacking your brain. It's addicting everyone. It's making you do these things and there's nothing you can do about it. And of course, ironically, when we believe that rubbish, it's not scientifically true. It's not addicting everyone. That's not true. But when we believe it, it becomes true. When we tell ourselves, oh, there's nothing I can do, right? My kids are addicted to video games. There's nothing I can do. Uh, my phone is, you know, I can't stop using it. The algorithms, they got me. When we believe this rubbish, and we see this in the workplace all the time, I, I have to check my phone all the time. I work in a distributed team. I'm in the client services business. I have no choice. I call BS. It's not true unless you believe it's true. Yeah, that reminds me of a workshop that I had years ago, and I had two franchisees from the same franchise that were present, and the franchisor had, a, had advised them strongly that they needed to be there. So they weren't overly excited to be there. They didn't think they needed to be there, but they uh, had agreed to be there. And the reason why they were there is because they had some, some behavioral issues, <laughs> if mm. you will. And it was so funny because one of the things we do is we just create a very tight context in the room because that's what I was teaching. And so we, we demonstrated that in the room. Well, one of the guys, so there was kind of an agreement. It's like, okay, if you're late, this is what happens. Like, you know, silence your cell phones, that kind of thing. And he said, well, I can't do that. Mm. I mean, like, I'm really important. Hmm. and you know what if a call comes through and yeah. it was just so interesting and I said to you know and so we talked about what happens in the business how, how long were you asking him to turn it off for uh for the just so, like so silent so yeah. for the day workshop right and mm -hmm. you, of course there's breaks in between and lunch and whatever but while we're in the room just keep it silent so it's not disturbing anyone else right not distracting right. anyone else All right and and so he had huge resistance to this you yeah. know, and it's just, and I had another gentleman another time that did the same thing. And, you know, and so there was a whole great learning experience for them and for the people in the room as we established, you know, the rules of the game, if you will, you're in, you're in my room this is what we're doing. Right. So, yeah. yeah, and we need to do that. But how often that happens in the workplace where people use that actually as a crutch. Right. Um, and, and, and actually in the process, not only distract themselves, but also distract others around them. And meetings are not effective because, you know, there's a whole bunch of people sitting on their phones. Right. No, that I see this all the time. And, and, you know, we're not saying, I'm not advocating for throwing away your devices. I'm not even saying don't use your device for the day. I love these technologies. They're wonderful, right? They make us very productive. I, I don't like these tactics of, you know, do a 30 day digital detox. I don't think that stuff works. But I do think that we can plan time to think in our day. We, if we're going to have a meeting, for example, what the heck, why do we have these meetings where half the people in the room have their minds somewhere else? I call these zombie meetings. We see bodies in the room, but the brains are somewhere else. Why do we do that? Why are we that having these longer. stupid meetings? Of course, yeah. every time I do a workshop or I teach a class, every time, and interestingly, it's usually the highest paid person in the room. It's the person who, who says, well, what are you going to do? Right? I know this is rude, but eh, you know, I'm the boss. 
And of course, this sets a precedent for everyone else because cell phones in meetings have a secondhand smoke effect. If I see you checking email, yeah. well, now I'm thinking, now I have an internal trigger thinking, oh my God, I probably have 100 emails waiting for me too. Now I better start checking. And pretty soon, what are we doing in this meeting? You know, we have people's bodies here, but their brains are elsewhere. And so I teach you how to hack back those meetings to make sure that every meeting we call, we make sure is an effective meeting. It turns out the number one source of distraction in the workplace is our colleagues, is other people. 80% of knowledge workers say the number one source of distraction is not their phones, not their computer. It is their colleagues interrupting them with superfluous meetings, with interruptions, with constant distraction, especially in open floor plan offices. So I teach you exactly how to hack back. But I want to make sure, by the way, I, want to, I wanted to, to talk to you about the, the things that you find distract you. I, I know we want to get to, to try and help you a bit. Yes. So I broke them down into day-to-day -day versus big picture. So um, the day-to-day -day ones, I go online. I'm, I do consider myself to be fairly indistractable. Uh, and yet then I'll go online and I'll tend to do like, I'll say, okay, I'm going to go on Google. And I mentioned this to you when we talked last time, yeah. you know, that I'll go on Google and, and, you know, and then Facebook's open and LinkedIn and all these other things. And it's just like, all of a sudden I'm down a rabbit hole and I'm like, wait yes. a second. And even if it's only for a few seconds, it still takes me out of the focus of where I was and what I was doing. And sometimes I'll find myself going, what was I here doing? And I right. close my browser and then I go, Oh, right. That's what it was. And then I have to open it. You know, and it's just like, what? Yeah. Is, I've, I mean, it's just, I was, it was kind of funny because older people have a saying, right? They talk about going into the kitchen and forgetting why they went to the kitchen and then, right? Your, your memory starts to go. I don't believe that. I don't buy that stuff. I think that, you know, we can be much older and, and have great memories and so forth. So I'm, I'm going with that. <laughs> it's yeah, not my yeah. age. Yeah, but the mo just, the yeah. modern version is you look at your phone to check the time and then you click through six apps and say, oh, I have notifications here, there, there why did I pick up my phone again? <laughs> what, what, what time is it? <laughs> right. Yeah, exactly. And 20 minutes just went by. So yeah, exactly. that was, that's one of them. There's another aspect of this. So there's, this is the intention, right? So I go, I go on, I wanted to do something and then I find myself on this rabbit trail. Um, the other thing is, is that when I, and you already talked about it, is that when I have a project or something then I say, okay, now I'm going to sit down and I'm going to write this book, for mm -hmm. example. Mm -hmm. And but I really want to do something else. Like I re mm. would rather actually go to the beach right now. Yeah. I know that I want to write, I want to do both, but right. right now I'd really like to go to the beach. And so that sometimes shows up. Yeah. And the third thing is, uh, which happens a lot. I mean, I have a podcast. So I have a lot of people that send me emails requesting to be on the show. And so, and people that want my feedback, you know, I coach entrepreneurs. So there's, there's, so there's that. But not all, not just clients. I'm talking about people that just know me as a business advisor, and so they say, "Hey, can I just pick your brain, mm -hmm, right, for mm -hmm. a few minutes?" Oh yeah. And so you know, right? So there's a lot of so so there's there's the request. There's all those requests of, "Hey, can you look at this? Can you do this? Can you yeah. can you read my book and review it and and so forth?" Which are all great tasks, and they take me away. And they're distracting. And they're distracting. They take me right. away from what I should be doing in the moment. Yeah. Okay. Let's do it. You ready to get to work here? Sure. Okay. So the first step is to master our internal triggers, is to understand that when we feel this itch, this psychological need, that we are the reason we go off track, the reason you have those multiple t tabs open and you Google something and go down this rabbit hole that you didn't intend is because you are looking to escape some kind of discomfort. Okay. And we need to acknowledge that there's nothing wrong with you right? Mm -hmm. This is perfectly normal behavior. When it comes to distraction, a lot of people t tend to fall into two categories. I call them the blamers or the shamers. The blamers, they say, oh, it's my technology. It's Facebook. It's email. It's Google. It's the chocolate cake that I didn't mean to eat. It's all that stuff outside of me that's the problem. Then you have what, what is called the shamers. The shamers say, this is the category I used to be in, when we get distracted, oh, maybe there's something wrong with me. Maybe I'm not cut out for this. Maybe I'm an imposter. Maybe I'm, I'm, I'm defective some way. You see, I'm lazy and we take it all on ourselves and we shame ourselves. And of course, that only makes things worse because we feel like, you know, we feel more of these internal triggers. And what do we do when we feel bad? We look for even more reasons to escape and we become more likely to become distracted. The so right on, way that, to, on that yeah. note, before you go into the solution, that's interesting that you say that because there's also a lot of gurus 
that will say, you know, if you're not focused, if you're not loving every moment of your day and being oh. on point, then you must hate your life. You know, that yeah. kind of thing. Oh my goodness. This, this, this religion around happiness drives me crazy because I, you know, a lot of people in the productivity and self-help community say that, you know, if somehow if you're not happy all the time, if you're not satisfied with your life, if everything isn't peachy keen all the time, well, then something's wrong with you. And I argue that is ridiculous, that happiness is a fleeting sensation. This bar that we all have that we're supposed to be happy all the time, think about this from an evolutionary basis. If there was ever a group of homo sapiens who were happy and satisfied and contented with their life all the time, our ancestors probably killed and ate them. Because that would not be an evolutionarily beneficial trait, right? We, okay. Our species has evolved to constantly want more. Right? That's what keeps us hunting and striving and inventing and creating. That perpetual disquietude is that fire that burns within us to want more. Now, that's not a bad thing. right? That's what helps us create and invent and improve our lot in life. But the idea here is how do we harness that sensation towards traction rather than distraction? And we start by, by giving ourselves a little slack and understanding, look, feeling bad is not bad. I don't subscribe to these gurus' notion that somehow if you feel bad, if you're not you know, following your passion, that somehow you're doing something wrong. No, no, no. Feeling bad is part of the human experience. It's about how we handle feeling bad. There's that Buddhist saying that suffering is inevitable. Uh, sorry, pain is inevitable, but suffering is not. That yeah. that pain is going to be there. That discomfort is going to be there, but you don't have to suffer from it. You can channel it towards traction rather than distraction to drive you forward as opposed to pulling you back. Now, yeah. how do we do this? Mm -hmm. uh, there's lots and lots of techniques in the book, but one is this fundamental understanding around what's going on, not having this crazy high bar that everything has to be fun and enjoyable all the time, that we have to be happy and contented. That's not the point. What we have to do instead is that when we feel these internal triggers, we need various tools to help us cope with them in a healthier manner. So let me just give you one very practical tool that I use almost every single day. When I find I'm about to get distracted, okay, in your, you, you know, we, we must be cut from the same cloth. When I write, I constantly want to check Google for a quick second just to research something, right? Let me just do a bit of research. <laughs> but of course, if I do that, I know it's going to happen. It's going to be an hour of research as opposed to doing what I really need to do, which is to write. <laughs> and so what do I do? When I feel that sensation, if you can catch yourself the moment before you do that distraction, if you can catch yourself and just write down what is that sensation? In the book, I give people a distraction tracker, right? So just write down the cessation. Psychologist tells us that this instantly gives us a sense of agency and control over that feeling. Okay, so that's step one. Step two is to explore that sensation with curiosity rather than contempt. So unlike the blamers and the shamers that are full of contempt, what you want to do is to be a claimer. A claimer acknowledges, look, this stuff isn't your fault. You didn't invent email. You didn't invent Facebook. You didn't invent uh, these, you know, the chocolate cake that's tempting you. You didn't invent that stuff. It's not your fault. It's your responsibility. Meaning you can't control what you feel. You can only control how you respond to those feelings. And so what we have to do is to change the way we, we, uh, we respond to those feelings in a healthier manner by getting curious rather than contemptuous. So if you can surf the urge, this is what psychologists call it, surf the urge, because sensations, these in uncomfortable internal triggers, they tend to crest and then subside. And so if you can surf the urge following what's called the 10-minute rule, and this isn't a technique I invented. This has been around for 20, 30 years from acceptance and commitment therapy, very powerful, very research-backed technique. What it tells us is that if you can just pause for a second and acknowledge this is what I'm feeling. And set a timer, right? Many times I'll just take out my phone. I'll say, set a timer for 10 minutes. I, I put so this it down. Is, so this is before I go online and I yes. want to So you want to try and catch yourself. That because inclination when I feel like I want to do it, that's where I right. stop. Right. Distraction okay. is an impulse control problem. That's what all distraction okay. is about. It's you know instantly ratching, be, reaching for something to take your mind off the pain and discomfort you're feeling, whether it's stress, anxiety, uncertainty, fatigue, whatever it might be. If you can catch yourself before that happens, note the sensation. Tell yourself, okay, I can give in in just 10 minutes. I can have that bite of chocolate cake. I can smoke that cigarette. I can check Google, whatever it might be that you, that you might get distracted from in 10 minutes. Now, in that 10 minutes, what you want to do is to just surf the urge, is to tell yourself you have two choices to make. You can either get back to the task at hand or explore that sensation with curiosity rather than contempt to cultivate self-compassion. How do we cultivate self-compassion? We talk to ourselves the way we would talk to a good friend. 
And you would be amazed if you just sit with yourself for just 10 minutes and let yourself talk to yourself the way you would talk to a good friend who might be struggling with the same problem, you would be amazed. By the time those 10 minutes are up, nine times out of 10, you'll be back to what you started, to the task you really want to get a hold of. Now, why is this so important? Because the more you do this, you're building yourself your sense of agency. You're teaching yourself that you are able to focus for that span, for that period of time. So that's just the tip of the iceberg. A lot more we can do, but that's just one very practical technique, this 10-minute rule that we can use to master the internal triggers. And that's step one to becoming indistractable. Now, well, now, and, I, and, I love, and I love that. I teach about presence and the mm -hmm. importance of presence and awareness. And what I'm hearing in what you're saying is, is it's, a, it's another level of being present with yourself to know how you're feeling. You know, oftentimes when we actually ask, when I ask people and say, what do you feel or what are you feeling right in this moment? And even for myself for many years, and still it's a, it's, it's one of those, it's an ongoing thing for me. It's just to go like checking in, how am I feeling? Right. A lot of times if the immediate reaction is, I don't know. Right. And right. because we aren't present with ourselves, we aren't, you know, we're so out there or we're so in our head that we're not actually connected to why it is that we're doing the things that we're doing Absolutely. and whether that's a distraction or that's attraction. Right. And, and that, that's that automatic response of, I don't know how I feel. I just feel crappy. So let me just check email because that makes me feel in control, right? This is why people check email all day long, every day is so because it gives them a sense of agency, right? When I feel like things are out of control, Hey, at least I can try and manage my email inbox. But we know, you know, there was a Harvard Business Review study that found that 25% of the emails that the average knowledge worker sends, they didn't need to send, and 25% of the emails that they receive, they didn't need to receive. Huge waste of time here, right? And the reason we do that is because we are grasping for agency, grasping for control. So we send more stupid emails. We call more superfluous meetings that didn't need to be called. And that not only distracts us, it distracts everyone around us, just as you mentioned earlier. So that's step one, mastering the internal triggers. The, the second step, is to make time for traction. Uh, one of the traits that I saw across every single person I interviewed in the five years that it took me to write this book, everyone I talked to who struggled with distraction, every single one of them had big old white space in their calendar. And when I would ask them, I'd say, wow, you know, that's really, it's really tough that you find it so difficult to, to do what you say you're going to do. And they would complain about how, you know, the, uh, their boss wants this, their kids want that. Did you hear what happened in the news? Did you see what happened on Twitter? I can't get anything done. And I would say, what did you plan to do today that you got distracted from? And they'd say, I'm not really sure. <laughs> right? So two thirds of people don't keep a calendar. The one third that do only keep a calendar for their work tasks. And so this, this practice of having a, a, a calendar that's blank, of course we're distracted. How can you call something a distraction if you don't know what it distracted you from? So keep, this is why I hate to-do lists. Not that, not that to-do lists are bad, but most people don't use them correctly in that a to-do list is just a list of all the output, right? But if you went to a baker and you said, hey, I need 100 loaves of bread, the baker would say, okay, well, I need the flour, I need the sugar, I need the salt, I need the yeast, I need the input in order to make the output. And yet with knowledge workers, we just say, put on everything on a to-do list, right? And magically, the to-do list fairy is going to come by and do it all for you. No, it doesn't, <laughs> right? You have to put that stuff on your calendar in yeah. a time box manner. And I'll give you a link for the show notes. I made a free tool. Anybody can access it. You don't have to sign up for a single thing. And the idea here is that you want to make a template for your week. So for one reason, so that you know the difference for every minute of your day, what is traction and what is distraction. And I would argue, put time for the fun stuff. Put time in your calendar to go to the beach. Put time on your calendar to check Facebook, to check YouTube, to do whatever it is you find fun, but put that time on your calendar. Why? There's a couple of reasons. One, if you don't do that, if you don't put time for the fun stuff, when the time comes at the end of the day and you just want to relax, you want to be with your kids, you want to watch something on Netflix, you want to just relax, if you just keep a to-do list that's not time box, you'll never finish that to-do list. And you feel crappy at the end of the day. You feel like a loser because yet again, you didn't do what you said you're going to do. See, you're not very good at finishing things, are you? That feels horrible and you're reinforcing this negative identity about yourself. Yeah, you As got like 37 to, things on your list. Yeah. I had a client yeah. one, she came to me, she said 37 things on her, on her list. And it's like, well, are you going to get all of those done in <laughs> one day? Never, never. Right, yeah. exactly. Because we don't, we, don't, we don't ask ourselves the input in order to get the output. 
So, right. so we day after day, you know what happens to this person. I used to have, it doesn't used to be me that 37 things on a to-do list. We recycle half of our to-do list from one day to the next, to the next. And every day we're reinforcing our identity that we don't do what we say we're going to do. We are lying to ourselves day in and day out. And we reinforce that identity as opposed to when you have a time box schedule, when you say, look, my goal isn't to finish anything. My goal is to work on a task for as long as I said I would without distraction. That's the only goal. Work on the task without distraction for the given period of time that you said you would work on it. And of course, if you do that consistently, you're going to get the output because you put in the input. And every time block, whether that time block is 30 minutes or an hour, you're a winner. You accomplished what you said you're going to do. You're reinforcing your identity that you are indistractable. You see, I did it again and I did it again and I did it again. And then when it gets to the end of the day and you want to watch Netflix, hey, that's exactly what I plan to do today, right? At 8 p.m., that's what I had on my calendar. Time to check Facebook or time to watch the big game or time to, to watch a movie on Netflix and you can do it without guilt and actually enjoy it. Oh, this is so good. This is so good. I have so many more questions that we didn't even get to, so we'll have to have you back. But, you know, there's, and, and it's all in your book. I know that you cover it. It's a pretty extensive, it's like 289 pages and you cover it. You're, you know, we talk about, you talk about relationships, you talk about some of the things you've touched on here. Yeah, workplace. Indistractable workplace, right? Workplace. Raising Just, indistractable kids. <laughs> oh, amazing. Yeah. Amazing. And I love what you said there about the calendar because as we're, we're going into this new year, there's people that have new year's resolutions and most new year's resolutions, people, it doesn't last three weeks, you right. know, they've already given up and then they beat themselves up. And so what I'm hearing you say, which is, this is like this side benefit of, of being indistractable is confidence. Mm -hmm. Is being mm -hmm. able to celebrate wins is being able to build yourself up in this process by knowing that you're actually getting things. You're doing what you said you were going to do, like you said, which is, right. which is actually being in integrity with yourself right. and being in integrity with other people. So, so, so very powerful. Yeah, and, I could have said it better. That's exactly right. And, and, you know, going into this new year and the intentions that people have is to break it down. And I love what you said there about outcomes you know, and in input versus outcomes, because I can write in my calendar, I can write, let's say, uh, write this book, write book. Okay. Mm. Well, <laughs> that's kind of general. Yeah. Then I look at that yeah. and I go, okay, what am I supposed to be doing? You know? So if I break it, I've learned for myself, if I break it down into tasks, right. And then it's like, create the outline, do this, do that. Then or I even have better something. based on time, because mm -hmm. if you have, you know, finish outline, well, if you didn't finish outline, then you failed. You failed, yes. right? And you're reinforcing that identity that I didn't do what I said I was going to do as opposed to work on outline for 30 minutes without distraction. Right. If you do that, you're reinforcing your identity as someone who is indistractable. And of course, if you do it again and again and again and again, you'll write the whole book, right? Yes. But the goal, the, the goal of each time block task on your calendar should never be finish the book. You'll never finish it in an hour, right? It, it, it takes years to, to finish a book. But of course, if you work on it consistently, and don't get distracted, then you'll finish it much faster than if you say, oh, I'll just get to it when I get to it, right? That's what most people do. I'll do it when I feel inspired, right? You know, I'll, I'll spend yeah, that quality that time worked. with my friends. <laughs> Let's get coffee sometimes, right? Well, you can't build relationships that way. You can't write a book that way. You can't build a great business that way. It requires di diligent effort over the long term. And that brings up a great point, is one of the things that helped me in getting back into integrity with myself, and you mentioned it in your book, is not committing to things that you're not willing to do. This whole let's do lunch. I mm. never tell anybody <laughs> that, yeah, let's do lunch or let's do yeah. this unless I'm committed to doing it and putting in a calendar because I don't, I don't want to put that out there. And then of course they yeah. have false expectations. Oh yeah, let's, let's get together sometime. But if yeah. I have no intention of actually making that happen. Yeah. Then, let me give you a little, can yeah. I give you a little, a little trick? Please. Um, so one of the things that I do, so I get a lot of these calls of, uh, or emails of, Hey, I'd love to run something by you. Or can we just do a quick coffee? If I did all the coffees that people ask me to go do with them, I'd have no time for anything else. So here's what I did. I'm, I have office hours every Thursday for one hour. I let anyone who wants to for free book 15 minutes with me. Okay. Now here's the thing. The calendar is kind of booked up, right? So you might have to wait a couple months, but here's the thing. Making people wait a little bit 
screens out a lot of people who aren't serious. And if you are serious, if you really, really do want to talk to me, no problem. That time is reserved. So I don't schedule anything else around it. That time is devoted to my readers who really have a question that they want addressed. No problem. I'll be there for free. doesn't cost a dime. I'm ready for you. Now, that's what I do as an author, but anyone can do this in their office as well. You know, we send so many emails every day that could be answered with a very quick personal discussion, right? But this is what floods our email inboxes are all these emails that, you know, could have been settled as opposed to 30 emails back and forth. They could have been settled with 30 seconds of a conversation. So what a lot of people do who have used the book, they will set office hours for the office when they say, look, from four o'clock to five o'clock on Tuesdays and Thursdays, my door is open. Please come in. I want you to talk, you know, save all those questions that occur in between those days, all the like little things that you need answered and come into my office. That's the time that's reserved for any of these questions. And don't send me these questions over email if we can quickly address them. Yeah, that reminds me of my dad. My dad passed away, but before then he, uh, uh, he, he was quite the gregarious person and very much had all these ideas. And so I remember working with these lawyers and I was busy. I was on focus. I was getting the work of like six, seven days where the work done in three days. Mm. I wasn't messing around. Mm. My dad would call and he would say like, this is your father, right? Like, you know, I, this is important. Right. Yeah, yeah. And he would say, I have an idea. And then he would call like an hour later. I have another idea. And I'm like, great. Can you group all of those ideas together and let's talk about it after hours? But right. it was just, it's, and that's what happens in the workplace. And some personalities tend to be a little bit more inclined to do that than others, I would say. Yeah, but yeah. it was just hilarious because I remember one day he called me five different times with five different things. <laughs> and I said, like, really? Yeah. And he's yeah. like, but I'm your father. This is important. I went, I know you're important. And, and that's why I've made time with you from four to five o'clock every single day for you to share as many ideas as you possibly want. And we're going to sit down together and go through those ideas. Because look, the fact is, it takes us 20 minutes to get back on task. If you're working on something and you're interrupted, the studies find it takes you 20 minutes to get back on that focused task. Yeah. So five interruptions times 20 minutes, you've wasted all that time in your day just getting back to the task at hand. Yeah. Nira, this is so good. This, this is so good. Thank you My so pleasure. much. I appreciate it and so Thank much you. fun. I encourage our listeners, go get a copy of Nira's book, Indistractable. You can find it on um, certainly on Amazon, uh, but indistractable.com is the website you can go to. Uh, there's also a website you can learn more about Nir and some of the things he does. His website is Nir and Far, that's N-I-R and Far.com is also, and you can of course find him on social I just so enjoyed this conversation. I think it is, again, perfect to topic to talk about at this time of any time of year, but especially this time of year as people are planning for their, uh, their new year. So thank you so much. I appreciate you. My pleasure. Thank you very much for having me. Yeah, so it was great. And for our listeners, I believe that leaders of transformation take action. So take action on something that you heard today. Maybe it's the next time you have that inclination to go and check your browser that you stop and check in and do that 10 minute rule and ask yourself, you know, the questions that Nira is, is, is talked about here. If you can't remember what that was because you were distracted, go back. <laughs> That's a beautiful thing about podcasts. You can rewind and listen to it over again. But I encourage you that take action today on something today, not next week, not next month, today, so that you can uh, move forward and you can, you know, I believe that transformation only happens through action. And otherwise it's just a lot of really good ideas. So I encourage you that we'd love to hear your stories. Again, you can go on leaders of transformation.com. You can find us on social media. We'd love to hear from you and appreciate you uh, being here today. And we look forward to seeing you on the next episode of leaders of transformation real soon.